Welcome to the Autosportradio.com show. We are coming to you from Green Street Pub and Eatery at 911 North Green Street in Brownsburg. This program is being presented by the Indy Dental Group. Indy 500 veteran Dr. Jack Miller and his wife Dr. Liz Lewis have a phenomenal practice. They're now up to six offices. If you need dental work, you think you haven't had any check lately, you need to check them out. Give them a call, make an appointment. The number is 317-846-6125. Their main office is at 92nd and Meridian. It's easy to get to off the interstate. Get, if you need dental work or you haven't had a check, check them out. Need insurance? VP Insurance is the place to go. They're located at 5004 West 16th Street, about a mile straight west of the Speedway. You can talk to uh, Mike Pardee or Tom, find out what you need, they'll help you out. And I've been with them for over 30 years, and every time I check, like the insurance commissioner says, they're the best. Give them a call, the number is 317-248-0070. SVRA. What a phenomenal organization it is. They got the F3 and the F4 series now, run by Scott Goodyear. They have brought back the Trans Am series to bigger than what it used to be. It's phenomenal. Want to find out where they're performing or what the events are? Go to svra.com and you'll be glad you did. They got sports cars, vintage sports cars. They got the Trans Am. They got the F3 and the F4. They got a full, full weekend when you go see them. Welcome. We're here live talking to everybody in here, and I want to remind you, if you haven't seen this book yet, it is spectacular. It's the master driver of the world. It's about the 1914 Cactus Derby. It's written by Mark Dill, and if you haven't got a copy, they're available on Amazon. If you live in the UK, they're on sale over there, and they're most major bookstores. The foreword is written by the one, the only, Willie T. Who else? Um, this is a great book. If you want to get an autographed copy, just go to markgdill.com and order a book and they'll autograph it and send it to you. It's a good book and when you read it, you'll think, who is there? Well, he wasn't. He's not that old, but very good author. It's, it's worth reading if you like racing and you, of course, have heard of the master driver of the world, Barney Oldfield. My first guest tonight is a gentleman that you've all probably heard of and have tried to stay away from. I know I did, but unfortunately, here he is. Uh, he was a race driver and, and, and a successful career starting out in the, in the midgets and so forth. Won numerous events and worked his way up to IndyCar. So we're going to talk about everything to do with that. Before I do that, I want to mention our in-house sound is courtesy of Pierce Sound Production. They make it happen so everybody can hear us. My guest, what can I say about the guy? I call him Merle the Pearl, Merle Bettenhausen. Thank you, Don. What's it like to be Merle Bettenhausen? Well, I tell everybody I'm the luckiest man alive, and I say that simply because uh, 1972 when I crashed at Michigan, and I was conscious through the whole crash, and, uh, and uh, a couple months later, I'm laying in the hospital, and the guy says, you know, Mar, you were about probably 45 seconds from having your eyeballs dissolve, and, uh, and maybe a minute, minute, minute and a half of dying from loss of blood from the arm. They couldn't get the fire out, so the, they, it took a while to get to me, and so I, I sat in the fire for a while. So, you know, when I heard that, and I thought, you know what, it's not that bad losing an arm when when you consider what could have happened and so God has blessed me and and I turned 80 last year and uh, and uh, to quote the, one of the best songs ever by the Bee Gees I'm staying alive <laughs> <laughs> the Bettenhausen's are originally from Tinley Park and I got to ask you this your father's name was Melvin how in the world did he get to Tony my dad uh, lost his dad when he was 18 months old, and he was the youngest of eight kids, and he was a little bit wild. No dad, no direction. He had a couple older brothers, but really, uh, he was probably, he'd probably be arrested in today's, <laughs> the way it worked. Well, arrested and let go, but uh, <laughs> anyway, 
And he grew up in, in a lot of fights. And at that time, Gene Tunney, famous boxer, was at his peak. And so my dad would get in fights, and, and he always praised Gene Tunney. And so they started calling him Tunney, and then Tunney changed to Tony. And I guess they liked Tony better than he did Melvin. And so, so it just hooked on him. And uh, yeah, I used to sign his checks, Tony, and his middle name was Eugene. He'd sign him Tony M. E. Bettenhausen. So I have his uh, Melvin as a middle name. Oh, really? I see. You wear it well. Thank you so it much. Looked, it looked, really looks good on you. Um, what got you into racing? Obviously, your dad was very well known, very successful. Uh, your, your two brothers were, Gary in particular, but Tony was quite here. What got you into racing? You said, I got to do this. You lost your dad in a, in a race car, but yet. The three of you guys got in the car. That's a, a very uh, interesting question. And uh, the point in time is that my dad was a race driver. His personality, who he was, was whatever makes up a good race driver. Everything in our life that we had in our home came from driving race cars. And uh, even though freakish accident driving somebody else's car is what killed him. The point being is that he was such a man, such a personality, by driving race cars, and we thought, you know what, that's a pretty good example to set for us. So of course Gary started, started race, racing go-karts, and uh, he was married, uh, had a little boy, and, and I didn't want to do that. We still had the farm going. 1964, Uncle Sam was after me. They wanted to draft me. And I was so supportive because Gary moved away from the home. And so I was at my mom and younger sister and brother. And so uh, they were after me, but we were losing property. We only owned 60 acres on the farm, but we farmed 540 when my dad died. And uh, decided that I didn't want to do the rest of my, do this the rest of my life and I wanted to get the army behind me. So in 1964, mom and I talked about it and we, we decided to sell all the farm machinery and uh, I volunteered for the draft in March 16th, 1965 and uh, went down to Fort Knox, had basic and then went out to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And when you came out of the army, did you fly, your first move was to climb in a race car? It was interesting. The only, only driving I had done was at Santa Fe Speedway in 1964. That's, in June 9th, I turned 21 years old, and back in the day, uh, no such thing as driving a race car until you were 21 years old. So the week after I turned 21, I, uh, I had a 54 Mercury that belonged to my cousin, and so we, we did what you do to a, a jalopy stock car at Santa Fe <laughs> and uh, started racing in Santa Fe. And second, second night out, I won my heat race. And uh, I think the fourth night out, I blew the engine. So Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> it had been sitting too long, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so, so I had about five weeks of racing at Santa Fe Speedway, went in the Army. And Fort Sill is located in Lawton, Oklahoma. And Lawton, Oklahoma has a, well, it was a third of a mile dirt track promoted by Lanny Edwards, who ended up owning the Devil's Bowl and got involved with the Chili Bowl and all that. But he was a, he was a, young, a young man there. And so I got permission from the Army to race. And in the summer of 1966, I got permission and I raced a mod with Modifieds at this Lawton Speedway. And uh, I think the sixth or seventh night out, I won the feature. So that was my extent of racing uh, when I got out. And uh, actually, I got out March 16th. There was a race in Lubbock, Texas. Gary was racing Bob Nowicki's midget. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had just recently been upside down at Manzanita, so we got the car all fixed, and we drove down there, and there was an older gentleman, his name was Walter Allard. Walter Allard had a, 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 a spring 
homemade midget, and the seat was wide enough that you and I could fit in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget the funniest thing. I actually, the first night out, it was a two night race, they raced Saturday and Sunday there. The first night out, I qualified 12. And it was so funny, we're lining up for the feature, and he's standing there and he's looking back and forth and he's going, I said, what's, what's wrong, Walter? He says, well, why are we way up here? And uh, he usually would bring the car to the track, find somebody that had a helmet, drive it, and they'd, they'd be the back markers. And, uh, and so I started 12th and I actually finished 10th. And the ironic twist to that particular night was that that was the first night Gary won a USAC feature in Bob Nowicki's car. So if, I, I remember when he lapped me, he gave me the thumbs up. So. <laughs> Are you sure it was a thumb? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I got out of his way. <laughs> well, you got into sprint cars and midgets, and you won. You, you weren't just out there running around. You, you won a number of events. I, uh, I, won, I won seven USAC midget races. Now I started racing in 1967, and my accident was 19. My accident was in 1972, so I didn't have a lot of experience. But uh, I just uh, got lots of lots of talking to from Big Brother Gary. He was just turning into a star then, you know. If you remember, he won his first uh, USAC sprint car race, I think, in 1968 at Terre Haute. And then you all remember the Gary Larry show for 68, 69, 70, and 71. And, uh, and I, I ran some sprinters. I never, I ran, I think my best finished, I had a third at door. actually two weeks before I lost my arm. And it never really hooked up with a, a good team, as I can say. I can use that as an excuse. <laughs> uh, but I, but I, I've mostly followed the midget series. and. And I was sixth in the midget standings in '68, and, and se seventh in '69. I was there, but I was I was just trying to be smart and uh, not not do anything crazy uh, because uh, I just thought that I could do it a little bit different. Gary was kind of a wild guy, and uh, <laughs> as we all know, and at every aspect, and uh, and so d d did well, and uh, and then finally. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, in 1972, the first race of the year was at the Astrodome. And Gary had built this midget, this monocoque midget, which did not have a frame and it was aluminum that was shaped, bent, and looked like, a, if you look from the end of it, it would be like a U. And then he bolted the front suspension and the back suspension to it. and. Uh, that, he built that in 1970 and won many races with it, but it went to the Astrodome. And I mean, Foyt ran second, and just so you know, he got lapped by Gary. I mean, so, so that was, uh, in, you know, Houston, that's his home. So, so Gary laps him, wins the race going away. And I was driving for Howard Lehman out of Springfield, Illinois. And uh, I had won, won, I think, two or three races for Howard. I finished sixth. And so the next race was at Manzanita. Now the, the opening race at Manzanita, it was kind of like the Midwest against the West. Uh, everybody came out, there was like 45 cars there. Well, Gary says, Howard's not going to Manzanita, drive mine. No pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go to Manzanita and, uh, and Howard, Lehman, Howard Lenny had like four cars there. And I mean, it was, it was a star-studded field. This was the first weekend that Gary was driving for Roger Penske in the Indy cars. So the deal that Gary had with Roger is that if there is a race Indy car weekend, you cannot drive midgets or sprint cars. So he said to me, well, we'll, we'll take the midget from, we stayed in Houston a week, the next week we went to Manzanita, just drive, drive my car. So we got there and practice okay and everything and uh, and Gary was so proud of this car, right? I mean, he just kept telling everybody, this car is just so unbelievable. Well, 
nobody believed Gary because every car Gary got in, you know, I mean, he was a winner in it. They just thought, yeah, it's Gary, it's not, it's not the car. So we go to Manzanita, and I say everybody's there. And I started fourth, and I took, the, I passed George Snyder and Doug Carruthers' car about the tenth lap, and no one was in the same zip code with me. I mean, I was long gone and won the race, and and that was the first time that Gary ever saw me win a race, because we usually race, he's over here and I'm over here. And the funny thing, we had a fellow named Charlie Pritchard. Charlie Pritchard was about 84 years old. He was really old. Yeah, I'm 80. So, but <laughs> and I'm 84. Yeah, and uh, and so and he was just he go well, boy, and he talked like that, and uh, and and he had worked with my dad when my dad was racing. So, so he's at the Astrodome and Gary wins and well, I guess you're a betting house, you know. So now we go to Phoenix and uh, and I went and uh, honest to God, driving your brother's car winning a race that he had never seen me win before and beating all the stars, all, I mean all the stars. It was the moment uh, at that point in time, my, my highlight of my life at that time. So <laughs> we get in the car to leave the track and Charlie's sitting in the back seat and he's like this, he goes, well boys, are you gonna let anybody else win this year? <laughs> <laughs> they talk real slow like that. So anyway, but it was it was really good. And Gary went out in his first race with Penske, ran third at, at Phoenix. So we're driving back, and uh, and we'd been talking about me getting an Indy ride, and uh, we're going through Missouri somewhere in uh, Rollo. Some I can almost remember. And of course, you, when you do some, when you win a race. You think about it for the next week. I mean, it's just, uh, there was nothing coming up, just going home. And uh, now I'm thinking, and, and Gary's in the back seat, Charlie's sitting alongside me, and he goes, you know what, Merle? You impressed me enough a couple days ago that I'm gonna see if I can get you an Indy ride. And I almost crashed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because he, he's such a, uh, man, not a lot of sentences, but uh, just for him when he said that, and and so he ended up. He went to Grand King, and he paid five thousand dollars for me to run at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, take my rookie test, and get done there. And uh, so we got ready for May and started that. So you want me to keep going? I'm not. I know I'm cutting you few short on words, but uh, no, it's, you don't care. No, I, okay. I, I want to hear, Cause Cause you know me. Gary, I don't, I, Gary was I, very helpful in getting you along. I'd say that's series. pretty helpful. Now, 1972. I don't know how much five thousand dollars is today, but but it was a it, it was a pretty it big. It wouldn't buy two tires today. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so we go to the speedway, and I'm going to give you the whole story, and uh, and I I get it's a brand new car. It's a McLaren copy. I mean, Grant King was a genius. And Steve Krisloff was driving the other one. But the first race of the year was at Trenton. And at Trenton, though always, you know, always Trenton ran before the Speedway. I don't know what Krisloff did, but something, a mechanical problem, George Steiner was driving the car. When he went out to practice, the windshields where they were designed, this, the windshield on, George's car, which ended up to be the one I drove, was was so flappy that it, that it was bothering him. So they took some piece of aluminum and they bent it like an angle iron, and they bolted it to each side of the windshield, and it stopped the windshield from flapping. <laughs> well, he falls out of the race. I mean, he he, he never never qualified. Pat McCann. Now we all know, because this is a, this is not many people have heard this story. But I'm going to tell you the, the real story is your buddy Paul Harvey would say. Yeah. And uh, and so we go to the speedway and take the rookie test. Everything is fine. Everything went well. And Gary's watching over me. He's in the in the crew as as I took my rookie test. And he told Wally Muskowski, he said, uh, 
don't run this car unless I'm here because I want to I want to know exactly what what Merle says of what's going on that's when we used to get on the track at nine o'clock in the morning and get you know that's when the rookies would basically run and get out of the way and then the good guys would start going fast later the second day after after I took my rookie test we go out and it was pushing I mean I turned the, I couldn't do any more if I if I gassed it any harder it would have ran into the wall so so I came in, I told Walt, I said, Wally, it's just, it's still pushing, whatever. May God strike me dead if one word this is. So Wally's got a, now this is 1972, it's not quite computers and the, what we have now. But he said, well, I'll fix that. And he, he, he took a crescent wrench out of his back pocket, loosened the two wing struts on the back of the wing and took his hand and bang, on the top of the wing. He said, that, that should work. No, no gauges, no nothing to see if he took a half a degree more or whatever he took out. So I pull out of the pits. This is about 10.30 in the morning. Gary's not there. I go, one, two, three, crash. I never made a laugh because when he hit that rear wing and lowered it, he took that much downforce off the back of the car that uh, I, I just came through floor and all went and spun, hit the inside wall. It d d didn't do a lot of damage. So, oh, Gary, he, did he get on with Meskowski for, you know, m messing with the car with him not being there? So we went to Grand Shot, we got the car all back together, got it back out for the last weekend of qualifying. And, uh, and I had been going, I think my best lap was right at 176.0, and the, and the slow, the 33rd fastest qualifier was like 78.2, so I was like two and a half miles long. I don't know if I would have made it or not. But anyway, so Gary gets in the car, and then, oh, it's like my dad driving, getting in Paul Russo's car back in 1961. Everybody's, oh, he goes, well, he goes out and he went, he went just a little over 178 in the car and came in and said, it's, it's, it's pretty good, Merle. So we got in line and we're ready. And I was the next car ready to go out when the gun went off. So I never did make a qualifying attempt. So, so, <laughs> uh, Grant's got the $5,000, so, we, he still owes me a race, right? That's Gary paid him five grand for me to take a rookie test and, and race once. So the next race is Pocono. So we go to Pocono, and this was, if I remember the floods in, in, in Pennsylvania back in 1970. So we practice for three days. We get the ready, ready to draw a number to qualify six o'clock Friday night, and they said, well, uh, the, the airport's flooded at Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and so we got to cancel the race. So we cancel the race. I was I was like the 18th fastest, and there was about 28 cars or whatever. So the next race is Michigan. So we go to Michigan. Everything went smooth. Went out there, and I qualified. I think 17th. And and I had my mind made up. I'm just going to get get up hopefully 200 laps or 100 laps, whatever the, the I think it was 100 laps. And uh, so we're Sunday morning we're at the race and the Valvoline truck comes down and fills all the cars up. And, and my mechanics was Jackie Howerton and Wally Muskowski. And we're sitting there and they're, okay, it's time to prepare so we'll get ready and gentlemen start your engines and I'm in the car. And I look forward, and the front shocks are bottomed out. And I go, Jackie, Jackie, look at this. And he goes, oh, a couple words he said there, not, yeah. not being able to repeat right now. Uh, and so he got, he got a jack under it, and he jacked the front up, and he spun the, the coils to get me some travel on the suspension. And uh, I don't know what the back was because need to say I didn't see that. Wally was back there, so what he did, I don't know. So the race starts, and I'd never been in a race. 
And, if I, and I was told not to get near another car in the track because <laughs> practice doesn't pay anything. So the race starts and the turbulence and, and my head's going like this and, and I'm turning the car and it's not turning. And, and I mean, it was probably the, I tell everybody I crashed on the third lap. I did a hell of a job. I should have crashed on the first lap. You know, that's, a, that's how ill handling and how uncomfortable I was driving the car. So I got a high coming off two and I hit the wall. And when I did, the cars back then, now you know today they own, the, the Indy car has 18 gallons of methanol in it, right? Yep. And the tank is right behind the driver. Yep. The engine's in back of it. Well, we had 70 gallons of methanol, 35 gallons on each side, and they were housed in a big fat inner tube, basically, no, yep. no, no real fuel cell. So I hit the wall, the right front comes back, ruptured, ruptures the right tank, and simultaneously, now watch, this is what, my head went over and hit the side of the windshield. The early full face helmets just had a plastic button that the, that the, wind, that the flip shield went over. Well, do you know when I went over and hit the side of the windshield, what I hit? The aluminum angle iron that kept the windshield from flopping when Snyder oh. drove it in Trenton. So boom, and it pops the, the, the button off. And so you could, there's pictures of the face, I had, a, I had a dark face shield on. You can see the face shield pop, springs around here and it's hanging down while the car bursts in the And guess what, I don't have anything on my face other yeah. than my face. <laughs> and. So the first instinct is the, I don't know where I'm going, but I don't want to be where I'm at. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I undid my seat belt and put my arms outside the cockpit. And just about that time, the car went back, back and hit the wall again. Never spun, never did anything. It hit the wall, boom, and, and what it did is it tore the uh, right side tires off. And so I'm going against this Armco guardrail I mean, the left side tires, there wasn't a scratch on the left side of the car. And it's, it's doing this all the way down the back stretch. Well, when I got, got, was pushed out of the car, trying to get out, it, it got my arm caught between the Armco guardrail and the race car. And so they broke the bone and then just cut it off. I tell you what, I was, I was in the fire that I never even knew my arm was gone. I just kept going down to, and I would put this arm in front of my face to, to protect myself from the fire. And I, then I go and try to get out and think, I'm not gonna, ladies, I'm not gonna use the words that I thought at this particular moment. <laughs> but as I came, went down the back switch and finally came to a stop, I'm going, and I finally went and I did this and I looked over and I saw that my arm was gone. And there was a firefighter, his name was Jerry Murray. He was one of the guys, had the Air Force silver fireproof uniform on. But there's just so many ironic little twists here. So I'm sitting right next to the wall, right? So this, this fuel tank is gone. But guess what I got over here? 35 gallons going through an inch crossover tube that went underneath the seat. And it's just burning and burning. And guess where the firefighters are? Over here. So they're shooting powder on me from on the left side. In the meantime, I got a flood of methanol that's burning one sheet of aluminum away from me. And and so I, when I saw my arm was gone, I yelled, oh God, help me, help me. It wasn't that, but it was close. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and they finally came in, this Jerry Murray came in and grabbed me and pulled me out of the, out of the car, and uh, they dumped five gallons of water on me, and I went to the infield hospital, and and uh, you know that was it. But the, the ironic twist, wouldn't, but the button wouldn't have come off if George Snyder hadn't put the aluminum <laughs> on there. Yeah. And all the while we ran that car, we only ran 20 gallons of fuel in it. So the only time it was filled up was at the start of the race. And we didn't have heavy enough springs for that extra 50 gallons of methanol that went in the car. 
that's like 300 pounds, you know, six pounds, of whatever it is. So, so that, no experience, sh shocks bottom out. But you know what? I was the only one that was pushing the throttle, the brake, turning the steering wheel. So I don't give a, whatever the car was wrong, I still take responsibility because no one was helping me at that time. And, and what happened was my fault. Uh, but, you know, over the years, the, the, this, this is stuff that's been known, but I'm not a, I'm not a whiner, you know, I, at least I hope I'm not. And, uh, and, and th these are the, the incidental little facts that, uh, that all led up to the, the shield coming off and, and the, the 70 gallons of fuel and the suspension being squashed. And so, but you know what? I'd be the luckiest guy alive right here. <laughs> So, I remember you telling somebody, it might have been me, that some lady asked you about the crash and how many laps you had run before that happened. You remember that? And you said, I crashed on the third lap. Yeah. And she said, it's a good thing you didn't go six. Oh, no, 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 no. Something like that. You know, it's a story you told. I know, but you don't have to spoil it. So, <laughs> so, I'm, so I, I'm in, can I do this? You still got me? So I'm in Meyer. 30 years ago. I'm standing in line. This, every word of this is a true story. There's no make-believe here. I'm standing in line, and I hear this voice goes, how did you lose your arm? And I, and I go, oh. And she's right in front of me. She's about this tall. And I said, it was in an IndyCar race. I went three laps, and I crashed. And she went, oh, I'm glad you didn't go six laps. <laughs> <laughs> that absolutely, God's yeah. word, is a true story that happened. So, but that's a, it's just a, you know, it's 52, it'd be 52 years on July 16th, and, and it's, all I know, it's a great conversation piece. You know, and I'm not very good at juggling. <laughs> but, 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 but there's a lot of things that I do, and I, and I think that, in a way, if you can get this screwed on properly, because it makes me work so hard to do things, because there's, there's no book, there's no movie, there's nothing, hmm, how am I going to do that? And at first, I drank a lot, and swore a lot, <laughs> and yelled at my wife a lot, but I finally decided that, I'm not going to get drunk, I'm not going to get mad, I'm going to get smarter. And so I've got the wheels turning here and it's been said that the average person in a lifetime, psychologist say, will use about 12%. That's all you use of what you got up here, 12%. There's so much more there, but we don't need to, so we don't use it. And you being in a different situation, it's new every day. Every time I walk up to something, I go, how am I going to do this? He said, you know what? Maybe you use 14 or 16 <laughs> percent. So you can take something, and I don't recommend this, don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> but, but you can use it if it, it powers you to think a little bit more on, on how to get something, because you don't have to you don't have to lose your arm to think a little more. <laughs> now, but if you do you lose your arm, you better think a little bit more. So, yeah, it's just, uh, uh, I'm a I'm most fortunate man alive or whatever. That's what I tell God every night. I'm, thank you for making me the most fortunate man alive. When you, when you left racing, you went and worked for a number of years for Ray Skillman, who was a race nut himself over the years and had been. Yeah, you know, I uh, I d d did n numerous things leading up to, uh, I, I, I worked at Indiana Farm Bureau Co-op, I worked at Roberts Dairy, because I, my education as I was growing up, didn't go to college, graduated from high school, C plus student, wanted to get out of there. Uh, Gary talked my dad into quitting, so he quit after his sophomore year, but I stuck it out, I'm the first betting house to get a high school graduation graduation certificate but uh, so I sat on a John Deere tractor most of my 
teenage years on the farm. And uh, here I am, I'm 29 years old, and I tear my arm off. And I, I say I'm gonna come back and race again. Just, just a thing that you, you gotta do. Now, in retrospect, well, <laughs> True story. I'm getting ready to Lost Creek, Kentucky, July, June 16th, 1973. It was all, it was 11 months later. I was back driving a race car, and I'm sitting under taking pictures on the front straightaway. And a guy comes up to me, and of course I got my uniform. and said, "You're Merle Bettenhausen, huh?" And I, yeah, he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "You know what? You didn't lose your arm. You lost your mind." <laughs> <laughs> And so, so I did this, and uh, I can only tell you one thing, is that uh, later that year, and I think August 17th or 21st or whatever, uh, we won a race at, Los, at uh, Johnson City, Tennessee. And you know the old story, uh, winning is such a magnificent feeling, and it's, it's hard to explain that you, 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 down inside you go, I blew their asses all off today, you know, and, and it, it, it's there. So I followed Bill Hart for 40 laps. I was faster than him. I passed him on the last lap, the last corner, and beat him by about eight inches. And so you go that, I blew their asses off, and I'm going to, and I did it with, not with one arm tied behind my back, <laughs> without the arm at all. <laughs> and, and so th that moment, I learned so much in life that it, it's, it's not so much what you do with this, but it is so much of what you do with this. And, uh, and uh, we, I've talked to other race drivers, the most difficult thing in the world to do is be faster than the guy in front of you and not try to pass him. And that particular night, I was faster than him in three and four coming to start finish line. And, but I knew, but he was better than me when I got down to one. So my mind is going, what are you gonna do, Merle? What are you gonna do, Merle? What? Because I knew if I tried to go around the outside of him, you know, race drivers are pretty smart. It's a quarter, a quarter mile dirt track, hard slick, bottom. Uh, but there's, it's a, generally two grooves if the guy in front of you stays on the bottom. But if, if you get a guy challenge you on the outside, you know what you do? You move up two feet, and now there's not two grooves anymore. But if you don't show the guy that you can get there, or you're that fast, uh, he just does his own thing. And, and anyway, so I thought, finally, I will wait the last lap, the last corner, make one attempt. If I pass him, I win. If I don't, I run second. Instead of going down and you know possibly crashing, and so I did just that, and uh, and he said to me so many times, words I can't use. <laughs> did you pass me, Merle? Yeah, uh, and it was, uh, and I I swear, if I had had two arms, I wouldn't have won the race, because I'd have stood up and started driving her like a milk truck, and uh, and he'd seen me and he just moved up and taken away the other outside groove and, and he'd have won the race. So, But I just found out that your, your mind is so valuable, oh, but only when you use it to the maximum. And, and I've had crazy things. I managed at an airport in Wisconsin, a racing team, and I got all this from John Deere exhaust fumes when I was, when they're kids. Uh, that was my education, so. And, uh, but anyway, so. I went to Wisconsin in 1984. I managed Tony's racing team in 83. He qualified ninth at the Speedway. Best starting spot. And, uh, and when winter rolled around, I saw Ot Grunewald owned the team. And he had, he had a Citation jet and a couple others. And he was based at the Waukesha County Airport in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I said to him, is there anything I can do this winter? I mean, I don't know what a, what a race team manager does you know, from from October to February or March, and he and he said, "Let me think, Merle." And he was from Holland, Dutch, and so he comes back to me. He says, "Would you? We just took over the Waukesha County Airport. You want to be my airport manager?" <laughs> Why not? 
<laughs> and so, so I flew back and forth for about six weeks and talked to my wife, and we decided that uh, maybe there's more security in managing an airport than there is managing a racing team. And so I gave up the racing team, went, moved to Wisconsin, managed the airport for, uh, let's see, 84, 85, 86. He was in the veal feed business, and uh, he made some mis financial mistakes. And so he had to depart with all but one airplane and decided that he didn't need the airport as a as a, a helper to get all this fuel cheaper and whatever you do to keep an airplane flying. And so I lost my job in the summer of, you know, summer of 86. So I was there two and a half years and uh, thought about moving, to get another airport job. But I thought, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm more of a car guy than that. So uh, no education and not much to fall back. I I started selling cars, and uh, Wild Cadillac was the first place I sold cars. I sold cars, Wild Cadillac, then I went to Wild Toyota, became a manager at Wild Honda. In the meantime, I don't know if any of you know this, but I had quite a talented son that played basketball. And uh, and they, they wouldn't let me off on Saturday morning to go watch it, an hour to watch him play basketball. So I had another thing in the back of my mind, and that was a training company to training in different dealerships so so I quit and, and, and got the training dealership but quick note on my son uh, my son was uh, six foot tall and uh, moved back to Indianapolis played at Lawrence North and he was recruited by a guy named I don't know if you guys are kind of young you might not remember this name but Steve Walford. People have heard that name, right? Okay. Well, he was he was co co coaching at Manchester Division Three, and he came down and watched my son. Uh, my son was was recruited by Wisconsin and uh, some other place, but but he was too too short. So my son is Steve Walford's first Division One recruit. And uh, that, that's, uh, if you're in basketball, that's a lot better than a guy winning a race with one arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so his senior year, Southwest Missouri State in Springfield, Missouri, his senior year, they made, made the tournament, and they got beat by Duke in the Sweet 16. They, won, they beat Wisconsin in the first round, and then they beat Tennessee and went to the Meadowlands, and got beat by the Duke team that all five starters went to the NBA. So, but anyways, uh, where was I? Uh, oh, so, so I could lose my airport job, and I got in the car business. Wild starts selling Cadillacs, work my way. Well, in 1991, uh, my wife and I got divorced, uh, and uh, she moved back to Indianapolis. I, I, my son, I went back to play basketball. My daughter was going to college at IU. So I'm freezing my ass off in Wisconsin. I'm thinking, my God. And I'm all by myself. So I called Tony in December 1994 and I said, Tony, you know, got any jobs back there that maybe a one-armed guy got, got a lot of experience? He says, well, why don't you go to work for Ray Skillman? And so, so I, I, I interviewed on the end of January of uh, 1995, and I started at Ray's on April 2nd, uh, 1995, and uh, Ray's such a funny guy. I said, when he, at, I was with him all day at the interview, and he goes, because he had stock cars he was working on and everything, and I said, Ray, do I have a job? And he goes, well, I don't know what to do with you, but I think I need someone like you. <laughs> so that's how he hired me, and, uh, and this is even more funny. So uh, he said, just get the lay of the land, Merle, and I was desking some deals, selling some cars, doing the different thing. And finally one day he said, Merle, come up to my office. I finally figured out what I'm gonna do with you. <laughs> so I go to his office, 
And you stand there and he goes, what, is, what am I going to do, Ray? He says, you're going to do all the shit I don't want to do anymore. <laughs> and I said, what would that be? He said, you're going to be my advertising manager. And you know what? My mind went, how do you spell that? A, D, B, E. Because I knew zero about it. But Ray, Ray looks inside a person and he sees abilities or non-abilities of the, what he thinks that person can do. And so, so he, he reached in his drawer and he had all these handwritten scripts for commercials. Now we only had three stores, well, four, we had Mitsubishi, Oldsmobile, GMC, and he had a Ford store. So, not like when I left and we had 14 stores. So, so I, you know, he's the kind of guy, how much rope you need, Merle? And he's, and the only thing you gotta be careful, if you take too much rope, you might hang yourself with it. And, and so I just started and, and I became his advertising manager. And that was, and I worked for him until, from 95 until 2010. I was 67, I retired on my, um, first of June in 1967, and probably the finest human being that ever walked this earth. I mean, still working today, he's gonna be 82, and, uh, and the millions he's given away, mostly, mostly to his stores around high schools, but Center Grove is, I mean, it's, that's his baby. I mean, he's just uh, uh, the kindest, wonderful man. And if you ever, if you've not been to his museum down in Greenwood, you've got to go. And I'll tell you how to get in. You just push the buzzer and you say, and they say, excuse me, who, who is this? And just say, I'm a friend of Merle Bettenhausen. <laughs> that's the that's the admission, and I and I'm serious. Uh, he used to have it open to the public, and there were some families that came here, some kids, and they scratched three or four cars, and and that would be the only scratches on the cars in the museum. That's how nice they are. And so we, so we just closed it down, except for old timers have had <coughs> meetings there, and different different clubs, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> you left, Ray, retired, and you had another offer Seems to be had to do with airports at the Indianapolis well, yeah, airport. Well, yeah, I, when I moved down there, I had a few days, and the guy told me that the, this is a story, story, uh, and uh, he said uh, they're looking for someone to manage the parking lot out at Indianapolis International Airport. Well, I was a believer that whenever you could do a job interview, it was a great thing, great experience. It taught you to be quick on your feet and answer questions and not say um, 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 um. And so I gathered up my resume and uh, went out to the airport and knocked on about six or eight windows, doors. And I finally found out where the airport manager was. And so I walk in and the guy goes, you're hired. <laughs> and I go, oh, hired? I said, you haven't asked me a question? You haven't uh, seen my resume. Why, what do you mean I'm hired? He says, no one can do this job like you. And I said, wait a minute. So, okay, what's the job? He says, you're going to stand at the entrance to the parking lot. The cars come in, they turn the corner, and just as they get to you, you go, long-term parking or short-term parking? <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. Now, part of that's true. I was here, ready to go to work for Ray, but the other stuff was just kind of, <laughs> kind of fun, kind of fun. So that's my that's my trademark story. So, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> now, try to put, you you try to go, oh, get flopping their arms. They don't know which way they're going. Well, listen, I want to. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time. I know I've been after you for quite a while, and, and you've been occupied on Tuesday nights for 14 years, you tell me, so I changed to Wednesday. You said, oh, no, now uh, I, I, tell you about I that don't one. have an excuse. Do I have time? I'm not much have until Dennis gets mad. Okay. <laughs> Tuesday nights, I belong to a veterans group called Warriors Hope, 
it's a it's a uh, faith based meeting of Army and Navy veterans, and Marines, guys with PTSD, different problems, and we meet and and the uh, Orrin Minix who runs it, he's a he's a pastor, he's a Marine, and so we we've, we've met for, for since I about a week about a month after I quit in 1970, I excuse me. 2010, you know, you, when you're old, you think the night, you still think 19, and so so I've been going that every time, and and I and prior to COVID coming out, I volunteered for 10 years. I went to the VA hospital every Monday for 10 years, and volunteered there, and and just gave them some words of of advice. Now, and I will, I want to tell you something. The nicest thing ever told to me. Are we out of time? Are we in overtime? Okay. I would. My job, I would go room to room, walk in and say, hi, my name is Merle. I wouldn't say my last name. Merle, I'm a, I'm a veteran. Spent two years at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And we'd start carrying on a conversation, talk about, I'd ask him about him, try to create some smiles and whatever. And uh, I say, this, what this, knew this man 10 minutes and he said this to me. I'm getting ready to leave and he goes, Merle, you're kind of special. I said, I know. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know I am. You know. He said, "No, no." And I said, "Not that." He says, "You have a, a unique ability. You make people smile, you make people laugh, and you make people stronger." Now, you know, when everybody take makes me, I make them smile, I make them laugh, and I make them stronger. Is there anything else someone could tell you who would make you feel better than what what he told me then? I mean, that's that's pretty special stuff, and uh, and I'm going to close, and I will shut up. I'm, and you know the way I look at life. I never had a yesterday that will be as good as my tomorrow. You got to work at that. I agree with you. What he said was great, but the, the one thing I think. To me, would be, I would be one step ahead of say, you won the lottery. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Listen, no. I appreciate you taking the time. I told you one of these days I'm going to fool you and do it on a Wednesday, and here we are, and you showed up. And how many times did I say no to Wednesday? Never. I only asked I'll, once. I, 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 I always told them that any, I won't, I won't skip my veterans group, but I'll come any other time. So. Any reason? So. Guys, you guys have been, been great and Merle it's Benhausen. fun. And Thank you, sir. Now, and I'll close with this. My, uh, wh wh I hired a fellow in 1995 at, at Racecoman. He was an Army vet. And he's now half owner in all the Racecoman stores out here on the west side. I hired him, I trained him, I tutored him, and he's a dear friend like my second son. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a sales meeting Monday morning. Now I said, now I want you to go tell all your salespeople, hey, we got a great speaker coming and he's going to be 81 years old. So <laughs> can you imagine what these young 20 year olds are thinking? Oh. So, so yeah, I just, uh, you, you got to keep on keeping on, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's the BG staying alive. And it's a great thing. So. I'm blessed, man, like nobody else in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merle Benhausen. This is the reason I call it Merle the Pearl. No you know, way. he probably would have got a bigger crowd if he wouldn't have told him I was going to be here. That, I thought of that, too. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. My and pleasure. Don't forget your hat. Okay. My pleasure. That's nice. Our next guest is a gentleman that... Uh, is a graduate of the University of Indianapolis. He's a very successful car dealer in the area, as everybody knows. And if I'm not mistaken, he is the longest running car owner and participant in the Indianapolis 500 since the inception of the Indy Racing League and the Indy Car Series. He's here every May. He has on occasion run other races along the way. But he'll be back again this year with several cars, I think, and uh, it's always fun to talk to him. He's got a family tradition in the racing world, 
He's done very well for himself, very well respected man. Please welcome Mr. Dennis Rangel. Thank you. Uh, do you. What got you into the racing? I know your grandpa, uh, Pop Dreyer, started long before you did and built cars and was a very successful, but what took you from being a businessman very successfully into racing? Uh, just a passion for it. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing to follow Murrah. Just a quick side note there to, to hear his some of his story. I would have gotten here earlier had I known he was going to be here. That was tremendous to hear. So uh, it, it our family tradition is not, not quite the same as, as your previous guest. Uh, but uh, my grandfather came here. It's been almost 100 years ago now. So... He came in and ran out of money in Indianapolis and needed a job and went to work for the Duesenberg brothers and then uh, did some work with Stutz and some other car manufacturers around uh, the city and started building, building his own cars, dryer midgets and sprint cars and uh, did a land speed record car with uh, Frank Lockhart back in 1926 and, and went out on his own after that. As a car builder, he was very successful. In fact, he had a series of cars that didn't they call them the uh, uh, dryerettes or something like that. Yeah, dryerettes were little kids' cars yeah. that he had in uh, Popular Mechanics magazine. That he, <laughs> he he built those and shipped them out and sold them as part of a kit during uh, the Depression to keep mm. uh, food on the table and keep things going because racing wasn't wasn't uh, going on as strong during that time, so he needed something to supplement things. So why did you get into it? I mean, was your father involved in it or anything, or just a passion you have for the sport? Uh, just a passion I have for the sport. Uh, I grew up on, uh, when I was younger, on West Washington Street, and then uh, we moved a little further out west, but uh, I had my grandfather and two different uncles were very involved in the Speedway and so it's always been a part of our lives and growing up and I went out there when I was a kid and uh, just got hooked immediately and became a big fan and loved it and uh, in our early days uh, Infinity is one of my brands at the car dealerships and they had a motor program if you recall the Infinity Indy, Indy engine program and I was involved with them and, and said, hey, give me a motor so I can go try to put something together at the Speedway because I know some of those people and I probably sold a little harder than what was reality, but uh, went out and, and kind of got started that way and teamed up with Eric DeBoard uh, and Robbie Buell to begin with. Uh, and we got Purex as a sponsor and put that together and uh, in 2000. So this is our 25th year at the Speedway. So uh, we've been doing it for a little while. So excited to be back again and and moving strong. And you and Robbie won a race. We won our very first race at uh, Walt Disney World in 2000. Yeah. Now, IndyCar isn't the only racing you do. You've got a full-time racing in other events around the world, actually. We do. We've got uh, Nitro Rally Cross. We're up in uh, Canada this weekend, up in Calgary for an ice race. <laughs> the only problem is for the second year in a row, Calgary is, if you see the weather reports, it's 50 and sunny up there. So the ice base is not looking really good and we may end up not being able to, to race up there. But the those cars run with spikes on the tires. The spikes are about an inch long or something like that. And so it needs a good ice base because they tear them up pretty bad. But we'll see if it happens or not. But you, don't you do off-road as well, or have done? Yeah, the, the rally cars are that. So it's this race happens to be on ice, but mostly they're dirt and pavement combinations uh, with big jumps. We've had gap jumps of 65 feet, um, so crazy stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's somewhat off-road. We're going to go more on pavement uh, in the future and try to attract car manufacturers uh, for their involvement. It's all electric also, which is pretty cool. So the new cars have about a thousand horsepower. They're all electric and our races are typically about six laps. They're all electric. They use lithium ion batteries? Uh, yeah, they, they are, um, what are they? they they're, uh, 
they're just really they're really finicky things so all the pro it's more of a engineering exercise than anything because all the batteries that uh, fit under the floorboard of the car we have to charge the car in between sessions so we can probably run it full blast at about uh, 15 minutes at a time and that's about it then you have to charge it again so uh, with using that much power they go through it pretty quickly I got to tell you something about something I'm involved in that would replace it and would last longer. A okay. Battery, a battery. Might, I'll, I'll tell you about it later on. But, you know, in, in your IndyCar program, you've had some pretty good people besides Robbie Jones. You had Buddy Lazare, Sarah Fisher, Buddy Rice, Ryan Briscoe, Al Unser, Jr., Townsend Bell, and Sage Carroll. What's happened to Sage? Where is he? Sage was uh, running uh, in the uh, NASCAR circuit, the, the feeder series in NASCAR, uh, the last couple years. So he, he's he been doing uh, pretty well. I keep I follow him, and, and hopefully he gets, uh, or he's able to go through the rankings there and, and be able to get in a cup car at some point. Um, how many cars are you planning on running in the Speedway this year? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard rumors that one driver that you're going to have is, is a local guy. I can't confirm or deny anything. Uh, you know, the sad thing is, and I, I told you when you call this, it's like, man, it's like the timing is so close. We're scheduled, actually, and I apologize to everybody here. We're scheduled to announce it tomorrow. So, unfortunately, and I would break tradition, and I would say out front who it is, but uh, we have sponsorship things riding on it, and so I have to try to keep my mouth shut, which is hard for me to do. Well, see, this program is being videotaped and won't it come out for another four, three or four or five days. Yeah, I've been on that, I've been caught up in that trap yeah. before, Don, thanks. And it's true. That's true, and these people won't say anything, and I certainly won't. Well, we're excited about our lineup this year, which we will talk about tomorrow. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. Well, I still heard that you got one year or two as a, as a local driver. Okay. <laughs> and I've heard that for a while, so I, I'm guessing, but I'll, I'll be... Yeah, we're not you. great at keeping secrets, but it's okay. I mean, it's tough to in IndyCar because uh, it's a small community and people talk and other people jump from shop to shop from a, a lot of times, and so uh, it's it's not an easy place to keep secrets in. See, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you could kind of just squeeze a little something out. Well, you're doing pretty well so far. Okay, that's what I thought. <clears throat> you you maintain a full-time crew, don't you? Yeah, we do. We uh, we do the rally cars and. We do some other uh, things for, for different industries. Uh, we have a machine shop, so we make pieces and components. We have a paint booth, and so we do some paint work for people and some body work and things like that. So we do a lot of different things to keep everybody in place. So so come January 1 or whatever date, uh, we're not out scrambling around to try to find people. Uh, the one thing that we have found by being uh, indie only is that we really a lot of people i mean the the series it's a, it's intense and it's a lot of travel and it's uh kind of non-stop and there's some burnout so we really target some of the people that are on the road for and kind of tired of it a little bit sick of being on the road semi retired from indycar but still want to be involved and still definitely want to be involved in the indy 500 uh we've had some good success attracting people like that to come come be part of our crew but uh, to supplement and, and complement our full-time guys we have probably uh what is it 12 i think full-time people at the at the uh, race team and then we uh swell up to probably about 25 to 30 people uh for the month of may if the opportunity presented itself to run more than one race a year would you do it uh, I'm torn on that one actually we were close to it before COVID we were we had some sponsorship momentum going and you know here's the thing if if we go out and think we can be competitive we have all the equipment we could go to whatever race and go show up there but to think that we would be competitive on a road course or a street course 
uh, there are different disciplines and different engineerings and the shocks and springs are so much different that we don't spend time testing those components. We don't do the shock and spring tests for anything other than the Indy 500. And aero the same way. We don't do any short course uh, aero testing or anything like that. So we really would show up and, and not be very competitive. Even though we have all the cars, we have the crew, uh, we could plug and play and go there, but it's, I don't really have an interest in going to a race uh, outside of Indy that you know you're not going to really be there and compete to win. It seems to me <clears throat> that uh, that falls in line with your business. Your, your very successful car dealership. How did you get into car dealership? Was that somebody your family had and you took it over or did you start it? Yeah, it was my parents. We started in our backyard on West Washington Street uh, <laughs> in 1968. So. I was a kid and we had a truck pull up and we were, I remember rolling up the chain link fence in the backyard and we unloaded five BMWs in the back in the grass and there we were in the car business. Uh, my grandfather has dryer or had dryer cycle. Now it's my, then it went to my uncle and now my cousin Mike Dryer uh, has dryer cycle on the west side here. And uh, so my grandfather had BMW motorcycles at the time. So we got to know BMW through that. And basically he called and said, hey, my son-in-law and my daughter want to sell cars. Uh, what do you think of that? And pretty much here comes a semi truck with, uh, with five BMWs and there we go. It was a little different in 1968, yeah. obviously, but uh, we had our first uh, shop was right there where the service department of Dryer Cycle is and then where Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki is right next door, we, that building we took over and renovated it. It was a laundromat and a restaurant. And so that was our second location. Then we were at 71st Street and 465 and then up to where we are now and then down across from Ray Skillman and Greenwood. Are you able to involve yourself in the racing and still keep your eye on the, on the dealerships? Yeah, I mean, it, I've had the same managers uh, at my stores for, uh, you know, the, the key people in each of the spots there have been like 30 years plus. Oh, so uh, they ran out of questions asked me a long time ago and uh, they don't want to hear my answers anyway. So they just go off on their own. So the only one thing I'm, I'm very good at is delegating. I'm a pretty good delegator. So I have let uh, them run things and I still meddle and get my hands involved and I'm still there every day but uh, they just they try to avoid me. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm assuming that you're better with a computer than I am and you can keep track of everything without talking to anybody. You can look and say uh oh or yippee. Yeah, I think I know where to look and, and <laughs> what to look for but it doesn't always work that way. Um, as a gra You did graduate from the University of Indianapolis. Yes. And you, you have got to be somebody that they would point to and say, this is what you can do with an education. Well, the university's been great to me. They've, uh, yeah, I mean, I've gotten several awards, which is really cool. I was on the uh, board of trustees there for uh, 13 years. And uh, uh, it's, it's a great university. It's a great part of the community. It's growing and, and getting better. Uh, we just got a new president in, so she's going to be taking over here, and and uh, the plans are exciting for the future for for the university. Well, I listened to the was it Crystal or Di Diamond, the radio station. That's what we listen to uh -huh. after twelve o'clock. They play jazz, so we listen to that and hear. And then uh, sometimes we'll turn it on and there's a football game or a basketball game. My wife says, Shh, I want to hear music. But, uh, I was part of that. I was actually the play-by-play -play man for our basketball team when I was there. So uh, the radio station uh, is uh, still going strong there. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't run it in the ground doing <laughs> doing my bit. Um, what do you think of of the IndyCar series? Although you only participate once, but you're in the biggest race, biggest single day sporting event in the world. And how do you think the series is looking? going forward because it looks like there'll be another one or two more cars on a full-time basis apparently by the way has don cusick ever called you and if he can hook something up 
Yeah, uh, he yeah. is going to be part of our announcement tomorrow. So oh, good. more more to come on that. Uh, he's a great guy. We worked with him with Stefan uh, Wilson last year, and Don wants to remain involved in IndyCar and, yeah. and keep going. And and so uh, we're working on things for the future. And and he's entrenched. He's a he's he's very actively involved in thermal uh the the sports car club out in palm desert right. and uh i went out there it blew me away it's like it's pretty amazing if, if you get a chance it's it's like uh disney world for uh car lovers and somehow they got a race out there he said he didn't have anything to do with it but i know that's he did we, he had a lot to do I'm with sure it he's a, a million dollars to win have you been invited uh, sort of. We were invited, but that, that falls under the category, again, that we don't have the setups to go to a natural terrain course like that and be very competitive. So uh, we, instead of really investing our time and effort on something like that, I'd rather just focus on the 500. Um, I, I, this is a shot in the dark. You'd like to win it. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> why we're going there. I, I think uh, uh, I'm excited about our driver lineup and the work we've done in the off season, uh, you know, since last race, that was a that was a mess. Uh, we didn't do very well, but uh, uh, we kind of put our heads together after at the end of the race and said, "What can we do differently to to be better prepared this year?" And it's it's hard. It's competitive uh, now. Uh, you know, the top fifteen cars are really really strong, and any one of them have a shot to be there at the end and so that's our deal is we want to be in the top 10 or 15 of, of those cars well is, is uh, mr cusick going to be in town tomorrow for the announcement he is not he is uh hosting some people out at thermal and uh uh hosting some sponsors and people like that so uh, well, he's, he's making not. his time time work well for us oh, he, he said, i had him on here and, I, and he said the next time he's in town he wants to do it again but Strangely enough, as busy as he is and what he came from and what he's done, if I contact him, he'll answer me almost immediately. Oh, so yeah, I, he will. Uh, and I keep in touch, so I'll have to get a, send him a text tonight or an email tonight and say, aha, <laughs> aha. Well, that probably wasn't supposed to say that either, so make it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is there anything else that you would like to do in, in the racing world? Is there anything you looked at? Yeah. Um, well, we were fortunate enough, fortunate enough to win the championship of uh, Nitro Rally Cross last year, and we're leading this year, knock on wood. So hopefully go back to back with that. And then uh, first and foremost is to win uh, just down the street here. That's, that's still the main goal. Uh, you know, uh, it's kind of an anniversary for us. Uh, you know, if I kind of round off and say my grandfather was here 100 years ago. Uh, if we qualify both cars, that'll be 50 cars in the Indy 500 that we, we will have have had this year. And then uh, 25 years of dry and rhyme racing. So a uh, pretty big year. It would kind of round it out nicely to finish one, two. I remember when, when uh, you and Robbie were together, he kept trying to tell me that it's not dry and rhyme bowl, it's Dennis and Robbie. I said, oh, really? DNR, that's what it says. <laughs> you hear from Robbie at all? I talked to him the other day. He, uh, of course, he was wrong about that. It was Dry and Rainbow, but uh, <laughs> he, 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 it was okay to call it Dennis and Robbie then as well. But yeah, I talked to him the other day. He's, he's uh, lives in Cleveland and still doing deals in Detroit and has some property here that he was talking to me about, had some questions about it, and, and uh, doing well. I think the last time I talked to him, which was a couple of years ago, he was in sponsorship or something. He said, I come to Indianapolis in May, but I don't stay. I do whatever it is I do. And then... I think, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things like I went to, after we stopped being full time, I went to the St. Pete race and walked around and was like, I got to get out of here. This is just <laughs> miserable. I mean, I couldn't explain how miserable I was walking through the paddock and having nothing to do and, and just, I did not enjoy myself at all. So I, I think there's some of that. Well, you could always enter a car, get yourself an engineer that's done this stuff and the reason you can't go forward, you, everything you do, you get into, you're successful in. 
Thank you. And uh, I've never heard anybody that said they dealt with your dealerships and said, I'll never go back there again. I've never heard that. They said, fine treatment. Well, that's our goal. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I hope that's the case. So we, we work at it and try to, I mean, we've been, it's, we're a local company and you treat people the way you expect to be treated. And uh, a lot of these things during the tough times, the last few years, we couldn't get cars and things like that. And so a lot of our competitors were marking cars up for no reason, just because they couldn't get cars. And we refused to do that because I don't like that when when I went shopping during uh, you know supply chain uh, problems, and something was just grossly overpriced. It kind of ticked me off. So I think people remember that, especially us Hoosiers. It's like yeah. you know our memories aren't that short that somebody does something wrong like that. It's they'll pay for it. Have Americans ever started making chips so that you don't have cars sitting in infields and racetracks so they don't have a chip to run them? <laughs> I've seen those too at airports all over the place. Um, it's slowly, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to turn around, but yeah, that chip manufacturing is going to start coming to the U.S. Car manufacturers are trying to take more and more control of things like that so that they don't have to, have to be reliant on third parties uh, like they have been uh recently so that will get better and the supply chain is is back in pretty good shape right now are you in favor of electric cars i am i'm in favor of them i don't think it's the end all be all i think uh right now hybrids are a really good way to go it's a good combination between gas power and electric you know uh hydrogen is probably where the future is going with a lot of cars but electric makes some sense in certain applications. So, uh, you know, here's the problem is, it, I think, my own opinion, is uh, car manufacturers are being forced into it a little bit more so than what they should be because the governments are, are forcing their hand and forcing them to do it. Whether it's right or not, I, I, don't, I think it's more political than it should be as opposed to being what's best for the world and, and for people. Well, I'm going to send you some information on a battery I think you want to look at, speaking of hydrogen. Okay. In fact, this company that I invested in has uh, the technology to convert diesel trucks to hydrogen without putting an engine in or anything. You've got whatever it takes to do it. I think you'll find it interesting, so I'll get in touch and show you that and might see what they can say, hey, we got something here, you go racing with it. Yeah, be reading. But anyway, um, you know, I, as I said opening, I think you're the old, longest running IndyCar team starting with uh, the Indy Racing League that have been here every year. Well, Foyt, we're second behind AJ. Um, and, and you kind of, if you count just the Indy Racing League, Foyt was here with us. We're second to them uh, if you don't count, of course, Penske and, and Ganassi and some of the guys that were in the in the other series during the split, so yeah. It's a strictly Indy Racing League yep. and Indy Car Series, but you've been here ever since. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting to see what you accomplished, what you have come from, where you've been, what you're doing, the business that you have built, and obviously your name is on the uh, top of the building, so that means you've got to answer for what goes on. And uh, as I said, I've never heard anybody is dealt with your company that said, I'll never do that again. So that speaks well. That's a good thing. So we like, I like hearing that, obviously. But yeah, I mean, we've got, we really just need to win this, this race because it's, it's like, that's been a goal of mine for a long time. And we finished in the top 10. I get congratulated. We, you know, we finished seventh a few years ago and I was so depressed. It was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and then people are congratulating me and sending me texts. It's like, no, that's not. So I guess I'm a bad loser, but uh, uh, until we win it, that's all you can be. So we're, we keep fighting hard and trying to do it. Well, you keep getting sponsors that allow you to help you accomplish it. And of course, there's nothing better they'd like than to say, we won't. Absolutely. Yeah, can't wait. And if anybody thinks the 33 cars that are in that race, there's 10 of them that are just there for the ride, 
Well, that's not all. There's 33 cars that want to win. Yeah, I think there used to be kind of cars out there just to fill the field, and that number is really small right now. It, it used to be, you know, you could count on your hand who really had a shot at winning, but now it's across the board, it's competitive. And to win that race, you have to beat a lot of really good cars, really good drivers, really good teams. And anything can happen on, on that one given day because – We've seen weather come into play so much where our car was great all week long and then race day is really hot. That's kind of been the trend the last several years. And have we adjusted as well as we should have for race day? Not really. And so uh, we, our depth, what our challenge is, is to have the depth of setups and be able to, to accommodate that. And our cars have handled really, really well mechanically. I mean, Last year with Ryan Hunter Ray, we had our, our wing adjuster broke early in the race. And it's like, you know, so now you have a really hard time chasing conditions throughout the day with no front wing adjustment. So you have to do it all for the rear wing, which takes a lot longer. And it's not as precise as what you do normally with the front. So um, we just haven't been able to put it all together yet, but we've been close a couple of times. Interestingly, when I came, I thought the cars just came off the truck, they went out of the track and started going. And yeah, it looks that way, but if you get a good close-up, you can see the cars are sliding out there, and, and it's pretty hairy, especially qualifying, hanging on for four laps, and, and you can't lift. If you lift, you lose a mile an hour or two, and once you start that, then the handling goes away, and it's all of a sudden your fourth lap doesn't look very nice. Yeah, well. It's an interesting sport, and it's something that I've been here since 1964. And there's something about the sport, the people in it are smart. You don't read about the drivers, you know, getting, going to jail for some nonsense like other professional sports. Uh, back when I first started, to see two guys fighting each other at the short track after the race, going at each other with two by fours, and that night, and the next morning, they were trading tools and stuff to fix cars to go racing in the night that next night so it's an interesting sport good fun and as silly as it is i'm still here because i still enjoy the heck out of it yeah same here and uh would it be exciting to see you pull off a run that would really be something one shot a year and you win it that really, wow i don't think it's impossible i feel like we've got as good a shot as anyone out there it's oh, like sure. uh yeah, we prepare really hard and, and we do have some advantages that the full-time teams don't, so uh, our guys are rested, that's yeah. for sure, when we go in there, so that's a good thing. Uh, we don't run the Grand Prix. We've done it before, but we don't do it because uh, we don't want to have the cars to turn around and get ready for uh, the week of, of practice. So uh, our focus is only on the one thing, and we, don't, we try to eliminate as many distractions. I mean, the place is so tough and things change every day on a daily basis and and so it's easy to go in there and get yourself lost or get yourself wrapped up in something that you shouldn't and so we we've, we've learned a little bit of that over the years is like keep your focus and don't lose sight of the big picture so hopefully we'll be there at the end of this year well i know there's people in here who'd like to see that happen and uh i'm one of them so i, I wish you Thank nothing you. but the best and your team nothing but the best and I appreciate you taking the time to come here tonight and sit down and chat. My pleasure. It's too bad I didn't try and know about your thing and schedule a program for Thursday night instead of Wednesday. If it was Thursday, if it was tomorrow night, I'd be blabbing like crazy. We have a lot to talk about. But uh, I apologize to everybody. I feel awful about that. I just uh, I always get yelled at. So. Well, I get yelled at. I get yelled at. I get yeah, I can at. come back. I can come back. I can pre-tape the next show, maybe. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. This is pre-tape. We'll go on. We'll go online for three or four days. So, okay. Well, you've had some good guesses, so I won't say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I say, all if right. it's Connor, we'll all be rooting for you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you out there. Donna, and if it's uh, where will we see the announcement? Where can we tune in? Uh, you can tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow we're doing a, uh, a conference with uh, Dave First at the Speedway. Not, I'm not going to go to the Speedway. Dave's calling in from the Speedway uh, at 3.30.
You're not going there? He's got to call you. You're too busy? I'm not too busy. I'd be happy to go there. I'd make excuses to go down there for any reason, but uh, you know, I asked that, and they said, no, you can call from the office. Like, okay. Is, that, is it going to be a Zoom? I, something like that. I don't know. It's a teleconference or whatever. Yeah, I don't a, know how they Zoom. do those things. Are the drivers going to be there? They are. But not Mr. Cusick. I didn't say that. <laughs> over the phone, over oh, okay. no one physically is oh, going to okay. be at okay. the announcement. Okay. Except for maybe day first, I guess he's going to. We'll all be somewhere talking about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, I wish you nothing but the best. I think it would be really remarkable and, and exciting to see you guys pull off a win. And it's and anybody says it's not possible, they don't know what the 500 is about. Anybody can win on any given day. I made a mistake, but I had Mark Miles here a year or so ago, and I said, there's, there's eight or 10 guys that can win the race. He said, no, you're not. There's 18 to 20 that can actually win a race on any given weekend. So I learned to keep my mouth shut and let me know that of the 33 starters, there's 33 that can win. Maybe one of them's yours. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, and I, you had told me going in, as you said, that the driver announced, but can't, you can't talk about it. But I, I think everybody's got a pretty good idea. Don't you? Doesn't you? I didn't say anything, though. I know you didn't. So if anybody says, did you, did you tell? You say no, I didn't. All right. Yes. Thanks for your time. Thank good you, Good luck in the 500. And Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Dennis Rainbow. Thank you. The next scheduled program, because of Thanks. thank you for uh, auto sport, because of um, Valentine's Day, the next scheduled program is on the 20th of February. Now, whether or not we'll get one before or after that, I'm not sure yet. And the part of the problem we have with getting drivers is the testing. It's going on when we normally do programs, so I got to work around testing. So I want to get some of the drivers, which we will be doing. So as of now, the next program is February 20th. If it changes, go on Facebook and my Don K Facebook page or the Autosport Radio Facebook page, or of course, if you're on my email list. But until the next time, thanks for being here. Thanks to uh, Merle Pearl and, and Dennis for being here. Until the next time, Don K said, thanks for being here. See you next time.